good morning to all. Uh, thank you for, for being as, with us this morning. Um, I will uh, directly give the floor uh, to Ms. Dorothy Tembo. Uh, she is Executive Director at Interim of the um, International Trade Center. Uh, Dorothy, the floor is yours for the introduction remarks. I think we should unmute her mic. Yeah, fine Thank to you. do that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Uh, and a very good morning to everyone. It is indeed my pleasure to warmly welcome you to the COVID-19 trade and leadership session, which will discuss the effect on uh, small, medium enterprises of supply chain reconfiguration in the wake of the great lockdown. Allow me to thank the World Academy of Art and Science and the United Nations for their effort and support in making this event happen. My sincere thanks go to Bernard Hochman and Mustafa Sadin Jalab, as well as our, our very own Marian Janssen for kindly accepting to lead the panel discussion. I am very excited this morning to see all of you that have joined into this conversation. And in particular, very pleasing that amongst you, I see that we have some policymakers or those that are coming from policymaking institutions, uh, private sector, international organization, media, business, and other civil society organizations, as well as expert individuals contributing to this discussion this morning. ITC's work is one that supports enterprises from developing and transition economies to become more competitive and connected to the global markets for trade and investment. We contribute to 10 global goals for sustainable development through fostering inclusive and sustainable growth and development. In so doing, ITC helps to raise incomes and increase employment opportunities, particularly for vulnerable groups such as young women, young people, women, and indeed marginalized communities. Over the past few months, we have experienced, as all of you are aware, an unprecedented shift in the way we work, consume goods and services, experiencing entertainment, or simply interact with others. The COVID-19 pandemic has recalibrated many aspects of our lives. Going forward, we will have to get used to a very different lifestyle. And I believe some of us have already started experiencing that, even if some restrictions are eased. Uh, I do believe that those of us that are in this part of the world have already seen that. Some measures have been lifted but we still are very much constrained in terms of what we can do. This is our new normal and has particularly changed the way that we are interacting at work, schooling, socializing, and, and, play, uh, and play have moved into the digital realm and take place from the confines of our homes. For example, Recent consumer data from 15 countries on five continents signal that we have, in effect, jumped five years ahead in e-commerce consumer behaviors in a matter of eight weeks. And I believe going forward, we will see a considerable sh additional shift in that direction. In addition to changing our daily lives, the COVID-19 pandemic has caused significant disruptions to supply chains across the world. The initial lockdown in China led to supply shocks, causing disruptions to the availability of goods from, sourced from China, including both finished goods for sale and products used in factories in developed markets. As COVID-19 spread globally, other nations began instituting lockdowns that have caused further supply chain shocks, particularly in global value chains hubs located in the European Union and the United States 
as well as China, as I have mentioned before. ITC estimates that the EU imports of manufacturing inputs will drop by $147 billion, while shutdowns in China and the US will lead to the reduction of imports of manufacturing inputs by as much as $42 billion and $38 billion respectively. Furthermore, new data from ITC estimates that African exporters will lose over $2.4 billion in global industrial supply chains exports due to the shock from factory shutdowns in the EU, the US, and indeed uh, China. Adding to this, global lockdowns have caused systemic demand shocks as governments and businesses began struggling to procure essential products and materials, placing enormous stress on the modern supply chain. On the positive side, however, the economic consequences of the pandemic are likely to trigger a rethink on how supply chains function, shifting the emphasis to resilience. This rethink could lead to long-lasting changes um, in the way we produce, develop, and indeed distribute goods and services I had, as I had alluded to earlier. Global supply chains will experience a reboot in the new normal, causing structural shifts in supply chains. It may well be that the initial shock from China-centered supply chains could cause China to lose its central position in many global supply networks. Additionally, governments and small and medium enterprises will also attempt to diversify their supply sources to reduce future exposure to risk or relocate to markets that offer a more stable and predictable policy environment. This shift could imply refocusing on regional value chains to shorten supply chains. Some companies could also start moving portions of their supply chain back home, given the cost efficiencies provided through automation and small batch productions. Small and medium-sized enterprises will also have to adapt to changing consumer demand and market opportunities, which may cause further disruptions to existing supply chains. Currently, most countries worldwide outsource the production of medical textiles and protective gear. The immediate need for these items has prompted domestic production in some countries such as Morocco and Tunisia. This strategic capacity will most likely continue in the future. Additionally, many sectors such as the apparel sector sell to a few markets with end consumers primarily located in the EU and the US. Reduced demand from consumers and other trade restrictive measures in these regions could lead to companies broadening their supply base to multiple markets, including non-traditional markets. For instance, clothing manufacturers in the Middle East and in North Africa could explore markets in sub-Saharan Africa. The rethink in global supply chains particularly the shift towards regional supply chains, represents an opportunity for economic growth in developing countries. One such example is the African continental free trade area, which aims to stimulate and facilitate intrasadic trade by creating a single market across sovereign nations. Full implementation is expected to lead to significant gains, including $16.1 billion in welfare gains, GDP growth between 1% to 3%, employment growth by 1.2%, intra-African trade growth by 33%, and a 50% reduction in Africa's trade deficit. The COVID-19 pandemic presents new challenges as well as new opportunities for MSMEs and the global supply chains. And to shed light on this issue, the ITC's 2020 SME Competitive Outlook Report analyzes the impact of COVID-19 on SMEs, 
internal supply chains, and indeed on the trade side. The report guides business, businesses, policymakers, and business support organization on post-pandemic recovery strategies and aims to help SME ecosystems weather the crisis and gear up for the new normal, emphasizing the need for resilient, sustainable, and inclusive trade and leadership. Lead firms have in many cases passed the risk burden along to the supply chain to the vulnerable SMEs in developing countries, resulting in job losses, bankruptcies, and uh, uh, so on and so forth. The report recommends that lead firms redesign their approach to collaborate with smaller suppliers to ensure that more equally shared value to more equally shared value to build resilience and sustainability into the chain. This report will be released next week, and I would urge all of you to read it. And on that uh, positive, not positive in the sense that we are getting more information in terms of what the pertaining situation is, but also better understanding what the potential opportunities could be available in this landscape, which is which has really been challenging to us, uh, should be something that is embraced and working amongst all of us collectively trying to find good solutions that enable not only the sustenance of the SME, M SMEs, but also looking at the much longer term uh, perspective of ensuring that they are indeed uh, part of the recovery process uh, going forward. I thank you for your attention and wish you very fruitful discussions this morning. Do you hear me? Yes. So thank you so much, Dorothy, for sharing um, these very important elements uh, that will help us um, this morning uh, during our uh, conversation. I would like to highlight the fact that we have uh, very high level uh, speakers this morning with us as Professor Bernard Huckmann, uh, who is from the Robert Schumann Center for Advanced Studies, Dean uh, External Relations of the European University Institute. We have also the pleasure to have Mustafa Sadni Jalab who is head of the research and training division at the Institute for Economic Development and Planning of the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. And of course, uh, Marion Janssen, uh, who is chief economist and director uh, of the division of market development at the International Trade Center. Um, in order um, to give the opportunity to each of these panelists to give um, their views on the, the situation. I will now give the floor uh, to Professor Bernard Huckmann, uh, who will um, give us a kind of snapshot of um, the, the, the international cooperation um, as it is now. Um, and he will highlight the positive and negative um, uh, sites of uh, the cooperation between the countries. So, um, Professor Huckman, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I'll just put my presentation on because I have some pictures. Okay, so I'm sorry. This is the problem of working from home. People bother you. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to speak. I'm going to speak to uh, this issue of um, trade and leadership, right? So essentially, what have, what have we seen in the in the context of COVID nineteen? And just to kind of set the scene, um, I'll, I'll focus primarily, this is a big topic, I'll focus primarily on what we're seeing on the trade policy front in terms of responses and reactions. Uh, so together with uh, the Global Trade Alert Initiative, uh, which is run by Simon Ebenet at the University of St. Gallen and the World Bank, we started a project which complements an effort which was also being undertaken by the ITC, 
is to track in as much real time as we can what are governments actually doing. Um, so this has been going on now for two months, this exercise. And what it shows is, on the one hand, you have a lot of governments who are, who are imposing restrictions on exports of critical supplies, so personal protective equipment, in particular, medical uh, products. And on the other hand, you have also a lot of governments who are getting rid of import restrictions on these same products. And essentially, if you think about what governments are trying to do, is they're trying to maximize the availability of these products at home. And they're doing that by saying, okay, we will not allow exports, we will subject exports to authorization regimes, and we will do as much as we can to get access to these supplies that are being produced in other countries by facilitating trade in those products, removing import tariffs, and so forth. Now, the data is actually quite interesting. You can find all of this on the Global Trade Alert homepage. There's a separate section which tracks uh, trade policy responses to COVID. And what you find is that you see over time more countries imposing export uh, controls. And on the other hand, you also see countries starting to take that off, right? So clearly this is in part an immediate kind of reaction to, a, to an emergency. Um, and the big question is going to be, how long are those measures in place? Will they be taken off? And to what extent is what is being done actually discriminatory in nature? So on the one hand, you have government saying, I want to have as much as I can do to actually ensure access and supply of these products at home. And then over time, but we also have trading partners and maybe we like some trading partners better than others. We don't really understand what drives these decisions. But I think that's an interesting area for research, for sure, to understand what's going on. So again, we have on the export side, a lot of restrictions. On the import side, we have a lot of liberalization. And I think here, one of the big questions is going to be, to what extent is this liberalization going to stick? Or is this going to be something that, again, is done on a temporary basis in a lot of countries? So the bottom line message from these graphs is we actually see governments using trade policy quite actively as part of the response to the, to the COVID-19 pandemic, right? And if, if we ask ourselves, why are governments doing this? It's clear, right? So we have sudden shock, we have excess demand for these products. We have limited supply availability. We don't have stocks because of the supply chain organization of global production, which relies on just-in-time delivery of inputs very low stocks because stocks are associated with fixed costs, which increase prices. So <clears throat> that's driving these responses. But at the same time, it's also pretty clear that if everyone is starting to use trade policy in this way, in a zero sum manner, it's actually going to have negative sum implications because it makes it more difficult for firms to respond in terms of expanding supply. I think some of the lessons that come out of what we've been seeing is clearly a need to maintain more stocks of essential supplies. Also clearly a need to diversify sourcing to encourage production of these products in different parts of the world. And I think an important need to actually recognize that trying to bring all these supply chains back home, if you will, back to the national environment is not the right approach to take because what we've also seen is even if you have a lot of capacity in a country, you produce a lot of the inputs that are required in a particular country, simply the supply isn't there because this is an exogenous shock. So as long as we can keep borders open, there's absolutely no really constraint in terms of the ability of firms to ramp up. And arguably firms can ramp up much more efficiently if they can rely on open markets, right? And I think one of the things that has happened in the COVID-19 response, especially initially, is a lot of these supply chains were broken up through trade policy responses, through requisitions, and that actually impeded the supply response. So arguably it made matters worse. It increased prices. There was a lot of running around, people competing for this limited supply, all of which I would argue was a negative sum type of uh, response to the crisis. Firms responded very rapidly, and we saw that everywhere in terms of trying to produce these products. 
And I think a question we need to ask ourselves, did governments actually do enough to support this response? Right, so I would argue on the trade policy front, some countries definitely did not, made matters worse. But I think there's also a lot of lessons to be learned with respect to having access to the technologies that underlie these types of products, knowing what the product standards are that apply, putting in place systems so that countries can actually recognize each other's standards so that firms who produce for a particular market also have the ability to ship those supplies to another market, right? And I'll come back to that um, in a little bit. I think one of the big lessons I take away from the trade policy dimension of what we've seen with respect to dealing with these imbalances between demand and supply is a need for much greater cooperation between countries, in particular in terms of providing information to each other. And here I would point to the agricultural example. So in 2007, 2006, 2007, 2011, 12, there were a number of these instances where global agricultural markets, we saw great increases in food prices, worries about limited availability of essential food commodities. And one of the things that was done at the time by the G20 was to put in place a system where governments actually exchange information and there were the relevant <clears throat> actors knew and cooperated in terms of, here's what global production looks like in these markets. Here is there is excess supply, here there is demand, here there is a way of actually providing countries with the food they need if they are worried about this. So essentially reducing the uncertainty with respect to availability of supply. And, and again, this is just a uh, speculation. There isn't any real evidence on this. But I think if we compare the responses by governments with respect to medical supplies to what was being done and what is still being done, on the agricultural side, we see much less in the way of export restrictions in the agricultural food area than we saw in these medical supply areas. And perhaps one reason for that is that you actually had a system in place through which governments could actually in interact with each other. They had access to information. They knew what the situation was. And the situation on agricultural commodity markets today is one where we don't really have severe shortages. Then that of course helps a lot. Now, this type of cooperation in today's world, where we have a lot of geopolitical tensions, we have an ongoing trade war between the United States and China, we have a lot of countries who are increasingly worried about uh, both competition from Chinese firms, but also more generally systemic competition. We're not going to see multilateral action, unfortunately, and clearly that would be first best. So I think what we're going to see and what we have been seeing is plurilateral cooperation. So if you ask yourself, what could be done in terms of internalizing some of the lessons from the COVID-19 policy responses, it's really groups of countries getting together and to saying, we will jointly agree that we will not impose export restrictions, that we will cooperate with each other to provide each other with information, <coughs> that we will help and work with each other to actually expand supply capacity, fixing bottlenecks in the supply chain, dealing with weak links, et cetera. And I think the positive side of the story is <clears throat> we've seen some of that happen. All right, so we've seen groups of countries actually do what I would argue is the right thing. And we already saw that happening before COVID-19 struck and that, took, and that is taking the form of plurilateral initiatives in the WTO including one on micro and small and medium-sized enterprises, um, as well as other initiatives, plurilateral talks. So if we just think about the COVID-19 reaction, where, where has the leadership come from? And that's really the theme of this particular webinar. We're seeing leadership come from what political scientists sometimes call middle powers from smaller countries, right? So we've seen that leadership come from countries like New Zealand, Singapore, Canada, Korea, and essentially it's really coming from the Asia Pacific region. So if you were to ask me, where are we seeing countries do what makes the most sense and where is there the most cooperation happening? It's really in the Asia Pacific. And if you ask, why is that the case? Partly that's because there are these systems that have been put in place uh, over time, like APEC, uh, like PEC. Um, but anyway, I think that's the stylized fact. And I think the the real leaders here are New Zealand, Singapore, who have put together a plurilateral 
agreement where they say, we will not impose export restrictions, we will work together to enhance supply. And I think what we, <clears throat> what we ideally would need to see is many more countries joining in that initiative. Unfortunately, the European Union is not part of this process. The United States is not part of this process. So some of the really large actors are missing. And we can ask and we can also have a discussion as to why that is the case. But I think really the leadership is coming from smaller countries. So I think the challenge looking forward is what can we do to encourage this type of cooperation to do more of it? And what are the constraints to it? And again, we don't have time to go into that in great depth. Maybe we can come back to that in the discussion. But I would argue we really need to build on this dynamic that has emerged in the last three, four years or so of plurilateral cooperation at the multilateral level. So instead of negotiating preferential discriminatory trade agreements, we're seeing this trend of let's talk about specific issues in the WTO and not everybody has to be part of this and we're not going to necessarily discriminate against countries that don't participate. Ideally, it will not result in discrimination. That's still a little bit of an open question because we haven't seen any of these agreements been concluded yet. But I think there's a lot that can be done to build on this dynamism. Right? And of course, one of those areas is specifically focused on MSMEs, which is of interest to this present discussion. But there's also ongoing discussions on domestic regulation of services, investment facilitation, e-commerce, all of which are critically important for SMEs all of which are directly relevant to the operation of supply chains, <clears throat> including for medical products. And I think one of the challenges is going to be, what can we learn and what should we learn from the COVID examples with respect to the use of trade policies and regulation that we should be feeding into those discussions, right? And I think that's one of my, that would be one of my suggestions in terms of moving forward in this area from the perspective of leveraging the WTO trade facilitation agreement, which doesn't deal with domestic regulation, which doesn't deal with investment, which really doesn't touch much on e-commerce except insofar as it involves trade in goods. There are specific supply chain uh, related options and opportunities to pursue this type of plurilateral cooperation. And again, this is, of course, completely dependent on what firms think, what governments are willing to do. But this is just a list of potential areas. One is to cooperate, to actually put in place systems so that we generate up-to-date information that governments can actually use with respect to how these supply chains operate. One of the things we discovered in the COVID-19 initial weeks is that governments really didn't have a clue what was actually going into these products, where they were being made, what the inputs were, what, what the supply and demand balances were, and so forth. There's clearly a need, I think, and great gains to be had from cooperating in terms of building stocks. And not just building stocks in terms of stockpiling, but also building stocks in terms of the capacity to actually very rapidly ramp up supply of critical products when needed. Right? And I think that points to kind of joint purchasing arrangements so that firms actually know what the demand curve is going to look like if there is a shock. Another opportunity for plurilateral cooperation, I would argue, revolves around mutual recognition and equivalence type of regimes. And here we've seen very clear examples where the absence of common standards or the absence of recognition of standards really has caused a big problem. Right? An example is firms in China <clears throat> who are producing substandard products as a result of which the Chinese government decided that you could only export these essential supplies if you had certification in China. Right now, that's understandable in terms of making sure that the products that go out actually meet standards. At the same time, if we would have had in place a system of mutual recognition and understanding and an acceptance of what each individual country is doing with respect to standards, we wouldn't have had those types of problems. So there's a lot that could be done I think a lot of this revolves around actually understanding the specific supply chains that matter. So one option here, which has been floating around for a while, is to think about creating value chain councils, which can actually generate this type of information in terms of how does the supply chain actually work? Where are there weak links in that chain? Where are there bottlenecks? What could governments do to actually get 
and <clears throat> help firms ramp up supply in instances where there is this excess demand. My final slide, and I've talked too long, so I'll skip over this very quickly, but I think if we go down this plurilateral track in terms of helping to support these types of initiatives, we're going to have to also think about the governance structure for them, right? And I think here there are a lot of things to be done in the WTO context in terms of making sure that the right actors actually have a voice, that they're kept informed, that they can participate. And here there's a big problem in the WTO because the WTO is still state to state, right? So that's a problem I think that would have to be addressed if we go down this track and we can come back to that in the question answer session. Um, <coughs> if you go to the EUI website, you'll find lots of papers on different dimensions of the things I've been talking about. So I will just point people there um, and feel free to get in touch with me as well. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you again, uh, Professor Hookman for this very interesting uh, presentation. Um, you spoke about cooperation, the importance of cooperation and um, the difference um, that cooperation took um, during this COVID-19 crisis. We, we are very fortunate to have uh, Mustafa with us that um, might certainly give us uh, more information about um, Africa, the African continent. I think that as um, uh, Dorothy Tembo also uh, underlined, uh, this COVID-19 uh, crisis is um, a, a crisis that, uh, of course, brings a lot of challenges to the world, but maybe brings also opportunities. And um, I would like to ask uh, to uh, Mustafa Sadni Jalab to give us uh, his point of view on the African continent, particularly uh, under, um, I would say, the eye of the African Continental Free Trade uh, Agreement and the measures that um, uh, they've taken, are they, these measures, in fact, mitigating the COVID-19's economic impact in Africa or not? Uh, will it be an opportunity for the African um, continent or the African uh, countries? Uh, Mustafa, the floor is yours. Could you please give us a bit more um, details about how uh, COVID-19 did hit African economies and um, will it uh, become worse? Is it going to worsen uh, according the worsening of uh, the situation of COVID-19 um, cases in Africa? We, we see for the moment that the continent uh, is a little bit spared, that it has not been the epicenter for the moment. We have a few cases compared to the population. So what about the economies and how are the different countries handling the lockdowns and um, um, in fact the change in the, in the supply changes, chains? Mustafa? Thank you very much, uh, Catherine, and uh, uh, thank you very much also for inviting me for this webinar. So I would like to thank Marion, uh, uh, Bernard as well, uh, panelists, and, and Dorothy, uh, the uh, interim executive director of ITC, and of course, um, was colleague for organizing this, uh, this session. So uh, yes, in fact, here I have a presentation, but I will circulate it uh, because if I put my presentation, I may be uh, worried that I will speak too much, <laughs> so uh, I will uh, I will provide some some elements and some points um, from uh, recent research we we have done, and uh, here as we say uh, I'm talking on my on my own capacity. So uh, here the the idea is for, is is really to to uh, indicate uh, how hard will the COVID-19 uh, hit African economies if the crisis worsens. And also I will echo some points uh, mentioned by um, Berner and um, Dorothy uh, about uh, how to mitigate uh, the impact uh, of the COVID-19 uh, crisis in Africa and uh, uh, what kind of leadership uh, also uh, could we have from, from Africa because it's also the topic uh, of, um, of this session. So just maybe some general remarks beyond the direct dramatic human consequences of uh, the, the ongoing crisis. Um, this uh, 
COVID-19 crisis, economic crisis, of course, it's first and foremost a, a human crisis. It will have a long-term and strong adverse impact uh, in Africa. Um, primary evaluation estimate a contraction of the GDP for the major African economies. Uh, we are talking about uh, 6% for, for, for uh, uh, Morocco, 4% for Egypt, 6% for South Africa, 5.6% for, for Nigeria. So we can see that uh, uh, there is here uh, a double effect uh, because there is the oil and commodity shock effect, which uh, really decrease uh, the economic impact uh, uh, in Africa. So just how hard will uh, COVID-19 hit African economies if the crisis worse? And this is my first point here in, 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 in my presentation. Um, if you look at the last um, IMF uh, forecast, but also ECA forecast that we just released a couple of weeks ago, uh, we have seen that uh, a minus 3% world GDP in 2020 is to be expected. And for Africa, we are talking about uh, minus 1.8 uh, GDP uh, growth. And this represents a, a, a very significant uh, decrease in terms of reduction compared to the initial uh, forecast. So what we did, in fact, is uh, uh, how to mitigate. What kind of recommendation, what kind of policy measures uh, do we need to put in place to mitigate uh, the uh, uh, social and, and economic impact of this uh, crisis uh, in Africa? Uh, what we did, in fact, we, we estimated um, various scenarios. I will just present two kind of results and try to draw up some lessons here and, and provide some, some, some discussion and some recommendation to, 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 to review later on during, during this webinar. So we estimated, in fact, two scenarios. The first scenario where we have a, a case where a global recession caused a 4% uh, person drop in global GDP. And uh, another one, which is a more severe, and what we are rightly observing right now, is a minus 8% drop in world GDP in case uh, that the pandemic uh, persists across the entire year. Because as we have seen, the situation is still not controlled, and, and the economic crisis is really impacting uh, uh, African economies. We found that if the situation were to deteriorate more than expected, with the global growth at uh, minus 4% uh, GDP, Africa will experience a decrease of minus 8% uh, uh, in terms of uh, GDP growth, which is very, very much important. And if we have even a more, uh, let's say, uh, uh, wide crisis in the world, uh, in that case, uh, uh, the loss for Africa will be minus 12% in terms of GDP growth. So you can see that the magnitude of the crisis will have uh, various impact also uh, for, uh, for, for Africa. So what we try to do is probably to uh, provide some responses. Uh, uh, how the CFT could mitigate uh, the impact of the crisis in Africa. And this is what we have tried to measure. And this is also a kind of echo of what Bernard was saying about trade facilitation measures. Uh, um, what we did in fact is to see uh, uh, how implementing the CFTA could support the mitigation of the crisis in Africa, and what could be the situation also if we implement trade facilitation measures, how to reduce, to reduce trade costs within African countries and how to uh, boost intra-African trade, which is something important, especially if we want uh, to uh, uh, develop you know, the industry as well in Africa, as we have seen that there is some shortcuts here. Uh, we observe that a successfully implemented CFTA will empower the region to a more uh, successfully, uh, uh, let's say, recovery in terms of GDP growth. And here, uh, uh, what we recommended also is a kind of removal of uh, intra-African tariffs and also try to prioritize you know, the acceleration, the acceleration, sorry, of the tariff dismantlement uh, that could be supported, for instance, through uh, customs, green line, or medical, pharmaceutical goods, or, or food products. So here, it's something important. And uh, considering the, the disruption of COVID-19 on value chains, this is something also uh, important, and uh, especially on trade operations, 
uh, including the expected trade uh, uh, restriction measures uh, that was highlighted also uh, in the first presentation, we anticipated a short-term rise in trade costs. And this, uh, uh, let's say, uh, rise of trade costs could be considered as 5% increase in trade costs for all countries across the world. And uh, we also try to include this uh, increase of trade cost uh, uh, within our estimate. And what we observed, we observed that if we implement the CFTA and if we also include trade facilitation measures, we can really mitigate the negative impact you know, of the COVID-19 crisis in Africa. And I think this is something important. I'm not going to give too, much, uh, uh, too many numbers, but, but maybe just one or two numbers. Uh, the impact of, uh, on the mitigation potential of the CFTA is significant as the change in GDP induced by COVID-19 is reduced from 8% to minus 4.3% uh, in terms of GDP growth. So we can see that implementing the CFTA has a strong impact in terms of reducing uh, the economic and social impact of the crisis uh, in Africa. But what is also very interesting is if we include also trade facilitation measures within the continent, it will also have a bigger impact. And this is what we did uh, also in some estimates. And it's quite uh, interesting to see that our results uh, indicate that at the sectoral level, trade facilitation reforms have a strong impact on intra-African trade in agriculture, in food, petroleum, and chemical products sectors uh, linked to the continental ambitious food security policy. And without implementation of such measures, uh, the disruption of the supply chains accompanied by the observed trade restrictions could seriously uh, affect the African food security and sovereignty, particularly in the time of uh, 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 several crises like the uh, plague of locusts in East Africa or uh, the continuous drought in the last three years in, in the southern part of, of the continent. Uh, now let me conclude by providing maybe some, some key conclusions or recommendations about uh, the way forward and also to kick up the discussion uh, with, with, with the participants. Uh, there are a number uh, of measures that uh, policymakers could consider implementing. I think the first one is uh, uh, really to uh, speed up the process of implementing the CFTA, especially if we want to mitigate the COVID-19 economic consequences uh, of this crisis, and also if uh, this crisis is going uh, to worsen, which is uh, which seems to be the case, especially in Africa with the lockdown, uh, we estimated that the weekly cost of the lockdown is nine billion dollars in Africa. It's quite significant. Uh, there are some studies done by ITC uh, which have shown also that the private sector is very much impacted. There are also many people, you know, uh, uh, moving to poverty between five and twenty-nine million people that we estimated are moving to poverty due to the crisis. So I think that in terms of leadership, we should also try to provide some recommendation how to really move from this crisis and provide quick win that could help to uh, exit from this vicious circle. And one of them is uh, uh, the implementation of the CFTA uh, that could really speed up, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the economic rec recovery, but also support the economic operators in the identification of priorities for trade facilitation reforms and a very ambitious, uh, let's say, uh, 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 agreement. At the sectoral level, fast tracking imports and export by creating green lanes for medical, pharmaceutical and food industry, I think are important, uh, especially if you want to build back better, uh, uh, how to, to, to build back better from, from, from this crisis and how to build uh, climate resilient and green regional value chains. I think the question of greening uh, economies and how to make African economy resilient is something important that should be including in the discussion and in, in the way forward. And uh, 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 finally, uh, uh, my last point here is uh, uh, how to uh, provide a fiscal space also to African economies. I think this issue is quite important how to make sure uh, that the economic recovery that the sectoral uh, uh, policies need to uh, 
uh, reduce the economic and social shocks are well implemented and this required also some uh, discussion and some measures uh, as far as fiscal and budgetary policies are concerned. Thank you very much and I, I will stop here. So thank you so much, uh, Mustafa, for, for sharing these, um, uh, this information about uh, the impact of COVID-19 on Africa and um, about um, uh, the possibility for uh, um, AFC, uh, FTA to, um, in fact, um, help Africa to find uh, new opportunities and maybe uh, new developments um, in that um, in, in add value in that value chain. But we are also very gifted to have Marion Janssen with us, um, Chief Economist Director at ITC. And Marion, we, we spoke about leadership. Uh, Professor Bernard Huckman um, made um, that presentation on, on leadership in Europe. Um, of course, Mustafa spoke a little bit more about leadership on the African continent. You could maybe give us a different perspective of the importance of leadership in that COVID-19 um, environment. Um, we, we, we know that there are different layers of leadership uh, that could that should be addressed. So could you please um, present uh, to our uh, viewers um, your, um, sit I mean, the situation and your position um, ab about um, an, an analyze of um, the actual situation. And after we'll go back to certain questions related uh, to the regions in the world. Uh, Marion, the, world, um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Catherine, um, and uh, very pleased to be here today with Bernard and um, Mustafa. Um, at the International Trade Center, um, our focus is on uh, helping small and medium-sized enterprises to integrate in markets um, and uh, to grow. Now, the world we work in and our stakeholders, small and medium-sized enterprises, they often seem to be far away from this policy-making space that Bernard and Mustafa um, were referring to. And nevertheless, they are very much affected by what happens in that policy-making space. They are also very much affected by external shocks like the one we have just been seeing, experiencing the COVID-19 shock. Um, we have during this uh, period been reaching out uh, to our stakeholders uh, across the world and we find uh, information like the uh, findings that two-thirds of the companies we are in touch with are telling us we are negatively or even severely negatively impacted by COVID-19 by the lockdown at home or by value chain interruptions or both and what is very worrying uh, one fifth of them tell us they may not survive over, during the next three months. Now, if you have in mind that globally, small and medium sized enterprises employ roughly 70% of the labor force, and if one fifth of them risk bankruptcy, then you can imagine how big the impact on employment can be of those small players not surviving. So we have in our uh, reaction to COVID-19, as is our role, very much focused on um, how to assist them. And when we look into the new normal, into the future, I think one of the things that comes up is how can we ensure that in situations like the ones we have been facing, those SMEs are better connected to the, uh, to the positions, to the places where decisions are being taken for global trade. Now, I would like to discuss this through three layers, and you make with reference to this. The SME is very typical SME, is very unlikely to speak to a national policymaker directly, and even less to um, a regional negotiation body or the WTO that Bernard has been referring to. There are players in between, and those players are often business support organizations. Chamber of Commerce, um, they can be sector associations, uh, we consider also standard setting bodies and uh, all the players around standards and regulation to be those business support organizations. They play an important role between the SME and the governments, the policymaker level. 
there are other players. Sometimes the SME is connected to that global level via um, multinational. Bernard made reference to value chains. So there, what happens um, to the SME through trade often is transmitted through the value chain and through the multinational company. So that's a second layer. How is the relationship between the SME and that lead form function? And then last but not least, a third layer would be the one that connects then this construct to the policymaking level. And Bernard referred to this, how is the public sector, how are governments connected to the private sector? How is this happening at the global policy level? And he also said that right now, the WTO is still a state-to-state -state venture. Now, let me try to speak on these three layers around the, uh, the COVID-19 crisis. And let me do it um, through the angle of how the risks have been transferred and how they have been discussed in these different contexts. Now, um, one thing uh, we have noticed first, SMEs have been very hardly exposed to the shock and they have also been operating in a very uncertain environment. They often didn't know, can I still export something to another country or is there a new trade measure? Can I still get something from my typical supplier? Is it going to be blocked? I need masks. Are the masks that I'm buying, um, are they safe or not? Very uncertain environment. So one first thing where we believe business support organizations have a very important role to play is to pass on information. Credible information on what is happening and what is relevant in this particular case. So in this case, where can, what is happening to trade measures? Berna uh, referred to one of the uh, tools that uh, firms can find uh, outside, uh, can find, have access to. We at ITC work on something called the Global Trade Help Desk with the World Bank, with UNCTAD, with the WTO, where SMEs can find information on what is happening at the border. But business support organization not only have information uh, in a role to play to pass information on what is happening in trade, they also had a role to play on what is happening in terms of government support. One striking finding from our survey was that 50% of the companies say, we know the government is doing something to help us, but we don't know what and how to access it. And in a crisis where rapid reaction is necessary, that's a blockage that should not exist and that in the current information digital age, we should find a way to overcome. So business support organizations have an important role to play to pass information from the policy, from the national level to their direct beneficiaries. They also have an important role to play to pass the voice of SMEs to the government level, potentially also to the global level. They are the ones who can say, this measure is working, this measure is not, here somebody is being left out, here the situation is very severe. Leaders uh, in those organizations who reacted strongly and rapidly in a coordinated way, they were able to help SMEs in their country or in their sector a lot. So leadership in these organizations is in our, according to our view, very important. And it's something that we have stipulated in our COVID-19 15 point action plan. So that's the first layer, business support organization. Second layer, lead firms. Dorothy Temple already made reference to the fact that unfortunately we have seen many lead firms letting their suppliers down. Sometimes this happened within contractual arrangements because SMEs sign contracts where the risks remain totally on their side, partly because these contracts with multinationals are too complex for them. Sometimes lead firms have let suppliers down um, by, breach, by break, break, breaking contracts. They simply didn't stick to their contractual arrangements, received goods and didn't pay for it or send goods back. That's the kind of thing that is, of course, detrimental for SMEs, but also, in our view, leads, weakens a lot the trust that SMEs and the people working there have in international trade and in globalization. So finding better ways to jointly manage crisis situations between lead forms and SMEs um, is something that we consider important for the future. 
In the report that we will launch next week, we speak about new forms of value chain governments for increased resilience. Now, the last question then is on the last layer. How can we connect those that value chain governance or those uh, business support organizations? How we can connect those voices to best to the policy level, including maybe at the global level, maybe at the WTO? Um, this is something we raise in our report as an important question for the future. I know Bernard has been working on this kind of issues uh, on, on the role of uh, for potential value chain councils and their connection to institutions like the WTO. Um, so we think that's an issue that uh, merits further discussion. And I would be very curious also to hear uh, whether that kind of uh, connections is envisaged in the African context, in the context of the African pre-continental agreement. In Europe, many things may not have worked uh, well, but within Europe, these different connectors did function within European Union trade, continue to function, uh, even so maybe at the global level, uh, we have seen other players uh, being more forceful, like Bernard has mentioned. The African Continental Free Trade Agreement has huge potential to build a more resilient African continent, in our view. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marion. Very interesting presentation that uh, makes perfectly the link with uh, what Bernard, Professor Bernard Huckman and Mustafa said. So Mustafa, the floor is yours. Mario asked you a very interesting question. What is your answer? No, thank you very much. And, and, and uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Marion, for, for, for your question. And uh, I mean, the presentation, which also highlights some uh, concerns, but at the same time, expectations uh, we we have at the continental level uh, especially how the cfta could support economic transformation i think uh, uh, you mentioned the question of value chains i think it's very much important what we observe is if we also want uh, to increase resilience in african economies uh, it's important also to increase and to boost into african trade and to create regional value chains within the continent. And this is something that uh, I know ITC is working also to support uh, the private sector in Africa, is also very much involved in the CFTA process. Uh, uh, what we observe concretely is uh, uh, we need, uh, as Bernard mentioned in his presentation, uh, to build the CFTA within the global uh, picture, within the global training system. And what we need is really to be able to use African commodities, to transform African commodities within the continent, to build uh, a regional value chains, but at the same time, to make sure that it has a positive impact in terms of uh, job creation, but also in terms of economic diversification. So the question is how to link uh, uh, regional value chains with economic transformation, economic diversification, sophistication of what we produce at the continental level and how we produce it I think are also key elements. And if we want to address properly and genuinely those aspects, we need also to address the supply side constraints. And here there's also very important uh, things that needs to be done, especially within the CFTA uh, uh, context. Now, as far as the mm, private sector is concerned and economic operators are concerned, I think you mentioned a very critical point is that uh, uh, what we observe with the lockdown is, is, is very worrisome in the sense that, as I mentioned before, uh, one week lockdown is the equivalent of $9 billion lost for the African continent. It's huge. It has dramatic uh, 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 implication in terms of uh, economic resilience. And the uh, corollary of this uh, result is that many people and, and many Africans are moving to poverty, especially in the informal sector where the situation is even worse. So building back better is something important. Promoting the private sector is something that needs to be included in any recovery, especially uh, when we talk about regional value chains and how to identify and really support uh, these regional value chains. I think this is something also uh, that uh, uh, need to be uh, really discussed 
uh, and invest in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mustafa. Um, you, Marion, you did speak uh, about the different layers of leadership. So um, maybe it, it would be interesting uh, to um, elaborate a little bit um, and, you know, in, to define the relationship between the private and the public sector. Um, I mean, um, could um, uh, we create maybe um, new uh, value chain councils? Um, could uh, the governmental institutions uh, relevant uh, um, for trade uh, be connected? Uh, we, we know that, um, and we've seen during this very, very um, difficult uh, moment of COVID-19 crisis, that leadership is so important. Leadership is important at the different levels of the, the community, of the society. And as Professor uh, Hukman mentioned um, at the beginning in his presentation, the cooperation between the different institutions um, is important, also between uh, governments and countries. So, um, Marion, I would like you to elaborate a little bit more on that. And I have also a question for Professor Bernard Huckman uh, about cooperation. Um, do you think that uh, Europe is uh, in fact missing the point in the world um, leadership to show the way of cooperation? Because as you said, you have a lot of restrictions on the one hand, um, um, opening, a, a big opening on the other one. Um, is that uh, liberalization going to stay uh, or not? Um, could you also give us more uh, infos on that about Europe, the role of Europe and Marion? So I give you first uh, the floor about that cooperation um, between um, the private uh, and public sector. Thank you, Catherine. Um, so I assume that we can go a bit over, over time. Um, the link between the public and private sector, it's a um, challenging and complex one. On the one hand, we see in this crisis that first the private sector was often very important to keep things going, also to get things through the border to find rapid solutions. Um, in many aspects, we need uh, private sector players. For instance, when it comes to designing standards and regulation for um, protective clothing in, for the crisis or for masks, the private sector uh, view has to be taken into account. If not, you may design standards that are completely inoperational. On the other hand, we know the private sector is profit-seeking. And that's what it should be. Governments have to represent those profit-seeking companies, but also have to take into account many other policy objectives, like protecting health, like redistribution, ensuring that poverty doesn't increase, um, like making sure that consumers are protected. So you have to find a way to link the private sector to the discussion without overly biasing, biasing it. And maybe Bernard has views on this because he has been working a lot on this matter of value chain councils. Bernard? Yeah, so just quickly on your question, um, and also I saw there were a couple of questions in the chats on this, essentially asking where is the EU in this, right? And, and I think the, the, it, it's an interesting kind of problem because on the one hand, people think of the EU as a block, right? And of course it is a major trading block. On the other hand, the EU consists of 27 member states and those member states do not all have the same interests. So one of the reasons the European Commission was in a sense forced to put in place exports restrictions and an authorization regime for exports of personal protective equipment, medical supplies, was because individual member states were doing that. And at the beginning of the crisis, and this also comes to another question that was on the chat on leadership, where essentially the, the point was made that leaders in a sense were panicking and then they start doing things which may not be the right things to do, right? Because they're looking for whatever they have. 
<coughs> and I think we saw that in Europe. All right, so we saw a number of member states essentially requisitioning all supplies and in fact even imposing barriers against other EU member states. Right, so this was done by France, it was done by Italy. Um, and obviously that's really bad news from the perspective of being a collective grouping. It has bad news for the single market because it essentially breaks down the internal market. So the European Commission was kind of forced to step in and say, listen, we're going to do this as European Union. And those of you who are putting in place export restrictions, we will now do this for the rest of the world. But please, ladies and gentlemen, let's not do it against each other because after all, we are the European Union. Now, the interesting thing there is the commission could not require this, right? There's no rule in the European treaties that says national governments cannot do what they were doing because it was a national emergency and they felt this was the right thing to do. So it's a very difficult balancing act, of course, in terms of figuring out what is the right thing to do. And I think this goes back to the last question that was asked on the chat, is again, it goes to what can we help leaders do not to panic? And I think one of the things we can help leaders do not to panic is actually give them the information. And I think here I want to pick up on something Marion said with respect to lead firms and what were some of the lead firms <clears throat> doing and engaging in public discussion and debate. You saw a huge variation in terms of the ability and willingness of the CEOs of some of these companies to actually come out and say, ladies and gentlemen, this is how the world works. Right? And I think for me, one of the very good examples is the CEO of 3M, right? which is a global company which produces in many parts of the world, which is a really big player in, in the personal protective equipment sphere, where that CEO actually got into a public fight with President Trump and essentially said, no, we're not going to do what you want us to do. One reason is it makes absolutely no sense what you're trying to get us to do. But I think that is all a reflection of, and I think there's a mix here of lack of information so not really knowing how the world works in terms of these supply chains and ideology right so in the case of the united states the current administration has an agenda and that agenda is really about reshoring so people in the administration saw this as an opportunity to say okay let's try and use covid to actually pursue what we're trying to do and i think there are elements of this also in the european union and I think it is something to seriously worry about because there's a lot of talk about resilience. And if you start scratching a bit at the surface of what do people mean when they say we need resilient supply chains, very quickly when people start explaining what they're actually looking for is they're looking essentially for self-sufficiency, right? So they're really looking for cutting apart these supply chains and saying, come home. So in that sense, Mr. Trump might not be completely alone. There are certainly also people in Europe who would never admit to being on his side of the argument, of any argument perhaps, but clearly if you look at what, they're, what the implications they're drawing from the crisis is, we need to do much more domestically within the European Union. And I think this is looking forward, uh, something that really has to be managed. So currently the European Union has just launched a review of its trade policy. And one of the questions it's asking European citizens is, okay, so what do you think we should be doing with our trade policy to improve resiliency of supply chains and supply? And a subtext of that is, and there are very strong voices within the European Union, which are really arguing for, we need more of this stuff made domestically, we cannot trust international markets. Now, I think for developing countries, that would be an absolute disaster, right? Because small countries obviously cannot produce these things themselves. They are absolutely reliant on imports. So I think it's something for them to really be aware of, be engaged in. And I think here, this takes me back to the WTO, where I think there should be much more proactive engagement by the block of smaller developing countries to say, what can we do collectively to try and help ensure that we don't go down this path, where essentially the big powers are really thinking mostly about themselves. Right? And here I do have a problem, and I'll end with this, where I think African governments need to be much more engaged on this, and I really don't see them. Uh, uh, for the moment, we don't see them, but I'm sure that they, they will certainly catch the opportunity. We're running out of time. There are many, many uh, questions, interesting questions. Um, I suppose that ITC will convey them uh, to you, Professor Hukman, and to Mustafa. Marion, the last uh, sentence, um, 
uh, to wrap up is, um, is for you. As being the only woman, only woman speaker and ITC representative, of course. I will keep it uh, short. Um, in our view, resilience uh, for the future will mean a better distribution of risks and a coordinated approach to solving problems. And this is one of the challenges for leadership in the future, for leadership in the area of trade. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Hookman. Thank you, Mustafa. Thank you, Marion. Thank you to Dorothy Tembo that uh, took uh, time for the introductions, uh, remarks at the beginning of uh, this conversation. And um, I'm wishing you um, a very good day and uh, continue to send uh, questions through uh, Twitter. It will be conveyed uh, to the, the speakers and they will answer you because uh, we've seen that there's a high level of interest. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you.